When legends, fairy tales, and fables speak of dragons without specifying a color, when they tell of kingdoms laid waste, virtuous maidens sacrificed, and valiant heroes sent home as charred corpses, odds are that they speak of the mighty red dragons. Also called flame dragons, fireworms, and mountain dragons, these horrific beasts epitomize the iconic dragon trait. All dragons are predators, but reds are the most voracious, consuming far more than they require. All dragons are greedy, but reds are avaricious beyond any point of reason, for they fully believe that all wealth belongs to those strong enough to take it, and that no amount of wealth is ever enough. The red dragon is the strongest chromatic dragon, and it very well knows it. In fact, it flaunts it. Its kind grows bigger than any other, save for the gold dragon who both share the ceiling for the respective branches. The red dragon being the strongest of the chromatic dragons, and the gold dragon being the strongest of the metallic dragons. They live in high mountains, volcanoes, and deep abandoned strongholds. The more geothermal activity, the better. Now, as far as the look of the dragon, there is no mistake in this one. You might have some difficulty telling some of the metallic dragons apart, or at least confusing them a bit. Hell, on our last video, I'm pretty sure I said copper dragon once when I meant to say bronze dragon. It happens, but when it comes to chromatic dragons, telling them apart is actually fairly easy and most of them have very discernible features. However, in the darkness of a dungeon where you wouldn't be able to discern color, there would actually be a few things that would let you know that you're currently facing a red dragon. The first thing are the two massive horns that calm the head of the dragon. This is a feature that every single red dragon has. Now, the horns can be different colors and might have different styles, so to a casual observer you might even confuse a red dragon with a copper dragon in this regard. But red dragon horns are typically very very long, at least far longer than coppers. These types of dragons do have differences though, and it might save your life to know them. The wings are different, but also the smells. Copper dragons have a stony smell to them, very earthy, whereas red dragons smell of sulfur and pumice, which is a sort of volcanic rock smell. Might sound too specific, but you gotta keep in mind that any druid worth its salt would be able to tell that smelly difference, as well as most of your scouting familiars. A good ranger should also be able to tell it apart, no problem. A big thing too, and this is something that the monster manual doesn't quite tell you, is that all all red dragons have a constant small stream of fire that juts out of their nostrils, especially when they're angry. This is not something necessarily that they can control, it just sort of happens to them, again, especially when they're angry. And keep in mind that red dragons are always angry, so this is probably very common. When you're looking at a red dragon, there's also, most of the times, a hot air mirage in front of it, as just the very presence of the dragon burns the air around it. Using these features, you should be able to at least differentiate this kind of dragon from coppers, but also from the rest. Keep in mind, too, that red dragons jump and attack everything. There is typically no dialogue when you meet one. It will just pounce on you, so uh, that's also a good tell. Now, let's go over the monster manual and see what exactly does it tell us about these magnificent creatures. The monster manual tells us that they are the most covetous out of all of the true dragons, and that they tirelessly seek to increase their treasure hordes. We know that they like mountainous terrains, but specifically any terrain where they can perch high and survey their domain. They seem to fight a lot with copper dragons, who also prefer mountains as their lairs. They tell us that when angered, they go into destructive rages, and that they are very impulsive creatures who are very easy to anger. They see themselves as kings and view the rest of dragonkind as inferior. It says here that even though they are fiercely territorial and isolationist, they seek to know about the events of the world and make use of lesser creatures to facilitate this knowledge for them. This part here is crucial. They tell us that for the most part that they want to know about other red dragons with which they compete for status. When a dragon requires servants, they demand fealty from evil humanoids. And if they don't get it, they destroy and threaten until they do. And lastly, we are told that their hordes are legendary, for they care for nothing else. Anything that has monetary value, they want. And they have the legendary ability to know exactly how much something is worth by just looking at it. 
a red dragon also knows the exact value of every item in its hoard, along with the item's exact location. So if something goes missing, the dragon would know immediately, and if it knows who took it, it will go to any lengths necessary to exterminate the individual, or go on a mindless rage where it ends up destroying anything nearby. Oh, and here on their lair, this is also a bit crucial, a red dragon likes to spend as much time outside of its lair as it does inside. We can't forget that one. So there you have it, this is what the monster manual tells us, and you know, it is actually pretty good as well. We just came from doing our last video on green dragons and they had a really good entry too, so that is really awesome to see. But now, to the crux of the video, let's talk about what the monster manual doesn't actually tell you. For starters, let's talk about the lair. Red dragons love mountains and volcanoes. It's not just in the lore, but it is almost as common sense as green dragons are to forests. Everyone knows that red dragons love to lair in volcanoes. Now, the monster manual specifies that dragons love to find places where they can perch, but it doesn't quite elaborate on just how important this is to them. What's interesting about the red dragon is that, much like the gold dragon, the actual location of its lair is really not that important as long as it has its one requisite. For the gold dragon, the requisite was that the location had to be a major source of magic. For red dragons, the requisite is that it has to have a location high up where it can survey its territory. And that's truly it. The dragon would actually much rather be on a cold peak with snow blanking its territory, or on a high mountain surrounding a dune or desert, or on a high crag surrounded by a forest, or on badlands overlooking a massive valley rather than a volcano with no view. It doesn't really matter what the territory is, as long as the dragon can perch high and see it all. The red dragon actually hates the cold, it, it just doesn't like it, but it would deal with it if it meant having a really high perch. In fact, the most popular places for red dragons to dwell in the Sword Coast are the mountains to the north, especially those at the spine of the world. Even though it is completely frozen all year round and unbelievably cold, those just have happen to be the tallest mountains in the region, and that's literally the only thing that these red dragons actually care about. I'm actually thinking, after we're done with this series, of making a video just sort of showing where all of the ancient dragons are here in the Sword Coast, and talking a little bit about them. I think that that would be kind of fun. But yeah, you very rarely actually see red dragons lairing in the crags south of the Sword Coast. That's just very rare for them. But I digress, the question now is though, what do red dragons do in these lairs? The monster manual doesn't quite tell you that outside of causing mayhem, red dragons spend the vast majority of their time developing tactics. These dragons love to have a strategy for every possible outcome. Is my lair attacked by a group of five mages who teleport right in my face? I should have a plan for that. Did my three dragon neighbors band together in order to take me down? We should probably build a strategy for that. Typically, when a situation arises, a red dragon generally has about two to three strategies that have been specifically designed for this eventuality, and when triggered, the dragon will simply randomly pick one of the options and go with it. The red dragon does not like to think much whilst in actual combat. It is mostly a very instinctual creature, so it creates these scenarios beforehand so that it can then follow them blindly when the situation arises. A beholder creates a thousand possible strategies for every outcome, but the beholder is neurotic and crazy, it's mad, typically. The red dragon is smart and calculated, and more than anything, it has time on his hands. Lots of time, actually. The monster miner doesn't tell you, but red dragons hibernate, and for very, very long periods of time though a more apt way of calling it would be periods of downtime for them. When a red dragon feels like it has accomplished what it needed to do, it will move into its lair and sleep generally for about 10 years before finally waking up. It is not quite as much as the green dragons though, who hibernate for up to 30 years at a time. In fact, it is stated that constantly do green dragons wake up from their sleep to find that their forest has been taken by a community who have built their houses around around the dragon's lair. Of course, infuriating the green dragon. The green dragon, though, is the only dragon that hibernates longer than the red dragon, though. Typically, around 10 years is what you would see max for these type of creatures. This makes sense for green dragons, who use their subtlety and bribery to manipulate humanoids, 
sense. So pulling the strings and then sleeping for 30 years makes sense for them. But red dragons use terror and murder to further their goals, so a little more activity is actually required for them. Now, the monster manual doesn't tell you that red dragons actually prefer to fight on the ground rather than in the air. See, these creatures are far too massive to employ delicate agile air movements, plus their biggest asset truly is their physical might. Very similar to copper dragons in this regard, red dragons are extremely fast and agile when they are in the ground. They leap around very fast, they move and weave in combat. They are not as adept or as awesome to watch on the ground as copper dragons, but they certainly would defeat a copper dragon on an even battle every single time. But rarely will these creatures actually ever fight a red dragon one on one. In fact, this is the single most infuriating aspect for them, especially when it comes to silver dragons. Red dragons hate silver dragons because they're constantly fighting against them, but silver dragons always win. Why? Because silver dragons employ the help of adventurers or other magical creatures in order to fight the dragon. This and the fact that the cold breath of the silver dragon slows the movements of the red dragon, which in turn makes the red dragon appear weak and sluggish when in combat, which in turn lowers the reputation of the red dragon. We will cover that in just a bit, but reputation is literally everything to a red dragon. Now, when it comes to gold dragons, things can get a bit muddy because gold dragons are actually equal if not stronger than red dragons, which creates a paradox in the dragon's mind. If I am the best of dragon kind, how come gold dragons can defeat me? See, here is a good quote on how they deal with them. Quote, Reds feel great rivalry with silver and copper dragons, but they save their most vociferous hatred for golds. The word vociferous is appropriate because while reds will loudly proclaim their eagerness to immediately dispatch any gold that they encounter, they often find some important reason why they shouldn't engage a gold in combat. The reason for this is that although they are overbearingly arrogant, reds aren't stupid. They know deep down that golds are more powerful than they even though they won't admit it, so they are less eager to start a battle that they could very well lose." End quote. When it comes to fighting humanoids, however, you would actually not know that the red dragon is actually very careful when it comes to using its fire breath. If the dragon can get away with not using it, then it won't. Why? Because red dragons are so greedy that they would actually rather just take some extra time in order to defeat you mano a mano just so that they don't burn away any valuables that you might actually be carrying. As the dragon is fighting you, it is actually thinking of all of the delicious loot that you have and it is very careful not to destroy it all with its breath weapon. See, wealth means so much to a red dragon because a dragon defines its status amongst other red dragons all based on wealth. Red dragons don't actually care about any other type of dragon, especially other chromatic dragons. All they care about is what their standing is among red dragons, who of course they consider to be the epitome of dragon kind. This is the main reason why red dragons love to have slaves, because they use those slaves to gather information for them about the world. But the biggest topic that they're interested in is finding out what other red dragons are doing. If the messenger brings information that another red dragon has a bigger horde than him, then it is chaos. This is when the dragon truly goes wild. See, the monster manual says that the dragon goes wild when a person steals from its horde. It says here, right here, actually, that the dragon goes and burns literally everything around its lair, including all of the villages and towns around. Now, this is kind of misleading a bit, because this sentence actually comes from an older text that clarifies that the dragon only destroys the towns and cities that housed and fed the person that robbed them. So it's not quite a mad rage as much as it is more of a controlled rage. The dragon knows who he's angry towards and unleashes that anger in that direction. This, however, actually goes out of the window when the dragon discovers that it lost face by having a neighboring dragon have a bigger horde than him. Sometimes he's not even just a bigger horde, but knowing that a neighboring dragon has done something epic that increases his reputation, which in turn lowers the reputation of other dragons in the area. This 
is when the red dragon really goes wild. This is when the dragon goes out there and burns the entire countryside, killing and murdering as many people as you can see. This is when the legends of the ferociousness of red dragons really truly come from. Now, what they do is they will always make sure to leave some people alive so that those people will run and spread the news of the dragon's might and ferocity. Because after all, what the dragon is really after is recognition of its might and power. It wants to have all the reputation as being the best red dragon in the area. Sages are sure that red dragons do not work together. It's not just in their mindset to ever cooperate with anyone as we just talked about. However, people that have had direct experiences with red dragons will surely tell you otherwise. Going back to the Sword Coast map, for example, the people of Silver March, which is this circle here, would actually tell you that they have had massive, constant issues with red dragons cooperating and attacking simultaneously. The reality of it though is what's actually happening is one one dragon will commit some epic act of evil by killing a bunch of people. A neighboring red dragon will hear of it and will go on a rage to try and one-up it. Then all the other neighbors will hear of it as well, who will also try and one-up it. This creates a massive wave of destruction where all red dragons are vying to become the most ferocious red dragon in the area. It is known by adventurers that this is actually the moment to hunt a red dragon, when one is in such a rage. Like we talked about it before, red dragons have contingencies for every single eventuality, but those strategies go out of the window when a dragon is in one of these rages. It is very explicitly written that when a dragon is rampaging through the fields in such a manner, it leaves itself vulnerable in many different ways, as it is not clearly thinking. So this would be the time to hunt one if you ever get the chance. Another use red dragons have for this information seeking they do towards other red dragons is to find out if a neighboring red dragon is weak or wounded. When such news are heard, the red dragon will actually attempt to kill the weak dragon in order to steal its lair and hoard. See, the one philosophy that red dragons keep close to their heart is the notion that if you can't defend your belongings, then you don't deserve your belongings. This is actually a philosophy that they hold for every other creature, and this is something that red dragons have that completely differs from most other dragons. See, a blue dragon typically hates metallic dragons. You would seldom see a blue dragon actively seek to kill a white or black dragon unless they're truly messing with each other's territories. Traumatic dragons deal with each other typically amicably, at least as much as they can, instead of trying to kill each other. You know, ditto with metallic dragons. You would never see a copper dragon actively seek to try and kill a brass dragon or really any other metallic dragon. Red dragons, though, will actively try to kill any other type of dragon that they meet. They hate everybody. In fact, the Monster Manual doesn't mention that even the religious belief of the red dragons confirms their notion of superiority amongst any other type of dragon. Red dragons believe that the creator of the world was a humongous red dragon named Asgorath, and whose spawns are literally all the red dragons that you see. They believe that other chromatic dragons lost their purity by losing their color, and that that makes them not worthy to carry the torch as the pinnacle of dragon kind. This might not be necessarily the actual truth, but that's irrelevant. That's just what red dragons choose to believe, and they truly see other chromatics as simply impure. Although for sure, their hatred for red dragons climaxes any hatred that they might have towards other chromatic dragons. They hate everybody, they just hate each other more. And this is why mating is very tricky, since of course you're dealing with two red dragons that are forced to deal with each other. The only reason that red dragon mating even works is because having a red dragon come to you to request your seed actually increases your reputation among other red dragons in the area because that shows that you are more desirable than all of the other red dragon neighbors. 99% of the time, what happens is a younger but very highly respected female will come to present herself to an older male. Because of the massive reputation boost, the male will almost always consent. Once the female is impregnated, the male will leave, leaving her to deal with the babies alone. The mother will protect the eggs until they hatch, but not with her life. A red dragon will always save herself rather than sacrifice herself for the eggs. And once the wormlings are born, it will not take long before the mother will leave them to fend for themselves. 
Red dragons are not very good parents <laughs> at all, and the parents will typically only teach them the very basics before leaving them to survive out there in the wilds by themselves. Now, these baby red wormlings will have a tremendously difficult time because they will actually share the same emotional baggage of their parents and will refuse to seek any help from any elder dragon. Typically, a baby wormling or a young dragon will seek advice from other dragons and other dragons will almost always help. This even applies for baby chromatic dragons. A black young dragon might seek help from an elder blue dragon, and the blue dragon will advise the baby. In fact, many female dragons, especially those who cannot have children anymore, will spend a large number of years just advising young dragons on how to survive out there in the wilds. This is very, very typical. A young red dragon will not seek this type of help, as that would imply that the young dragon needs something from someone else. And its pride will simply not have that. This makes growing up as a red dragon extremely challenging. On top of that, the bright red scalage of the dragon makes it pop on the mountainous background, which attracts a lot of predators, including humanoids who would want to kill the young dragon for its scales. This is on top of the fact that no town or city wants red dragons growing in their area for obvious reasons, so actively hunting young red dragons is actually quite common. Because of this, young red dragons will spend decades hiding on their caves until they grow old enough to be able to defend themselves. I should also point out that rarely would you actually see red dragons fight over a mate, since red dragons are very well aware of the lengths that a red dragon will go when offended. They seldom try to take a chance fighting a dragon that has been deemed as worthy by a female. Any of these confrontations will result in the death of one of the dragons, so they prudently quit the field when a superior rival makes a claim or is claimed by a female. Red dragons are actually quite smart when it comes to choosing who they will fight, and they will never pick a fight that they know that they will lose, even if they are so stubborn about their power. If your adventuring party is unknown and they find a red dragon, it will fight them without hesitation, 100% of the time. It will not even talk, it will just pounce on you, period. And once the battle has started, there will be no backing away. Backing away will lose them face with other red dragons. It will just fight to the death because of that. But red dragons do not lose face if they back away before the battle starts which they will do if they recognize your adventuring party and they know that it is a battle that they would have a hard time winning. Now this one is really cool. We sort of mentioned it in the intro, but it's one of my favorite factoids about red dragons that the monster manual does not tell you. The legends of red dragons asking for the sacrifice of young maidens is actually true. See, red dragons are fresh meat eaters. They have the ability to eat plants, but they would rather starve to death than try a vegan meal. What's interesting is that according to them, the younger the meat, the tastier it is. A red dragon will enjoy the meat of a teenager or young adult much more than that of an adult. And this also applies for all animals. A red dragon would much rather prefer to eat a young dragon's meat than an adult's dragon's meat. Now, it gets even crazier. According to red dragons, their favorite meats are that of humans and elves. Of course, the younger the better. But particularly, they claim that for whatever reason, females taste better than males. Hence, the best meat that any red dragon can have would be young females. This is why in Dungeons and Dragons, red dragons would go out of their way to ask for the sacrifice of maidens in exchange for the salvation of the town. This goes along with the mentality of dragons to want to terrorize and threaten humanoids that live close to their lair, sometimes even using its charm spell abilities to convince humanoids to go along with these sacrificing rituals. Now, the actual meat of the red dragon is also very much edible, if you were wondering. It is, however, extraordinarily spicy, to the point where, if ingested without the proper preparation, it will, and I quote, produce horrible cramps and extreme pain if ingested, end quote. The meat has to be aged and exposed to the open air for some time before it can be properly eaten. 
Oof, that was a really long one. <laughs> I hope that you guys enjoyed the video, and before you guys go, I would like to personally thank my patron supporters, Rukado Fan, Major Fail Gaming, Wyatt Curlin, Barry, Mascant, Toby Oliver, Dylan Baker, Zach Bowell, Casey Butler, Spencer Boach, and Meaty Ogre at Best for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please, please head on over to patreon.com slash Rex to support. Guys, thank you all so much for watching. Uh, make sure to like the video if you really liked it, dislike it if you didn't, follow me on Twitter, click on the playlist if you guys haven't actually seen all of the Dragon videos that we've been making, they are all incredible. I'm particularly really happy with this video, I think. The, the research um, was pretty taxing, but I think we got some really good secrets on this one. I'm, I'm really happy with it. In any case, thank you guys so much for watching. The next video will be Silver Dragons, and then the one after that would, of course, be the last video, The White Dragons. So make sure to tune in for those. In any case, I'm gonna leave you guys. Thank you so much for watching once again. Oh, I'm tired. <laughs> I'll see you guys on the next video. Bye-bye.